Okay, great stuff. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I suppose most of you will know me. I'm a lecturer in the computer science department as well. So we, we seem to uh, be just the room uh, that we used to sit in, Rory, Farshad and myself <laughs> in, this, uh, in this exercise here. Uh, but before I moved in with Farshad and Rory, I uh, spent about 10 years of my life uh, in the Nimbus Center uh, being a research manager rather than a researcher. Um, and that comes with uh, different priorities and different types of, um, let's say, metrics to, uh, to, to follow. So uh, what I did there in the Nimbus Center for about 10 years is build a research area uh, that uh, allowed us uh, to uh, have a funding pipeline within the European Union's Horizon framework. And, uh, of course, try to bring the different research interests of people together uh, so that we can uh, basically uh, do our stuff uh, that we're interested in, but having a pipeline of funding coming down the line. And, and for that, what is uh, crucially important, um, and that distinguishes it a little bit from uh, the 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 type of research many lecturers are doing because they have secure jobs and they can do whatever they like, um, uh, you need to basically follow the money and, and your research needs to be um, uh, designed in a way that you can fund yourself and your team. And that entails about half a million euro per year that you need to acquire. And I, I mean this with all seriousness. Uh, uh, this really requires a little bit of planning, a lot of planning. Um, and in particular, it requires you to read lots of policy documents rather than lots of scientific papers. So in this sense, uh, the, the job is, is slightly different uh, to what many of us might perceive as being a researcher at the beginning of our careers, uh, when it comes to uh, creating these strategies, um, we need to uh, some, sometimes, oftentimes think about the money. And the umbrella term that I try to coin there uh, is the human cyber physical system. So, so this is also a research area that I didn't completely make up myself. So there are other groups and people working on this. It is simply something that I feel fits very well into the European research landscape. And in a sense, it is also a gap in the market. And I will, I will talk about uh, what that means uh, in, uh, in a couple of minutes. So when I said we need to look at the policy documents, um, we need to understand uh, the, wh where the money is. And, and uh, the European money uh, is uh, in the Horizon uh, program. Uh, that's the framework program. This, this is over uh, seven year periods. And, and the current uh, period is from 2021 to 2027. And it is roughly 100 billion euros. So this is really a large chunk of money. And part of the strategy is to go where the money is. That, that, that's reasonably important. So I'm, I'm, I'm keeping I, I keep stressing the money aspect of that, uh, because uh, if you want to fund a team uh, of, uh, of, of researchers, you basically need to bring in the money. So looking at the Horizon Europe pro program uh, that is uh, running at the moment, it has a couple of areas that the European mission, uh, Commission calls missions. And this is the areas that they are spending this 100 uh, billion euro on. And if you read through these missions, we, we, we made a decision at some point that uh, uh, I don't do cancer, I don't do healthy oceans, and I don't have any stake in uh, soil health. Uh, so what remains are uh, the adaption to climate change um, and climate neutral cities. So it's, it's, it's really, um, if, if you exclude mission two, three, and five, you end up with projects that target climate change and sustainability, and that include societal transformation. So these are, are the, the buzzwords that are quite important if you want to um, write successful proposals in this, in this research area, and, and when you want to uh, get to a point uh, that, uh, that you can tap into this rather large pool of 100 billion euros uh, of, of, of funding. So when we drill down into this program, uh, we find that about half of it, a little bit more than half of it, is uh, what's called the pillar two, and that is um, uh, uh, about 
um, global challenges and uh, industrial competitiveness. And this breaks down into six clusters. Again, looking at the clusters, I try to identify with the missions in mind. So it's, it's all about sustainability. Uh, with the missions in mind, what are we able, or what am I able, or what are we able as MTU uh, to provide uh, to these missions? What clusters are we interested in? And Again, by excluding the topics that I don't have any experience in, um, we end up with the clusters four and five that are on digital industry uh, and climate, energy, and mobility. So, so these are the two areas out of this um, roughly uh, five, 50 billion uh, um, uh, bucket, uh, which represents 56% of the research and innovation budget of the EU, um, uh, which we might find topics that interest us. Um, so this is all about the motivation why I'm, I'm heading uh, to where I'm heading. So again, the European Commission then uh, uh, lists inside these clusters the areas of intervention. Um, and these areas of intervention are the topics that we can focus on when we are writing our funding proposals. Uh, when we are writing our funding proposals, we really need to understand what comes down the line until 2027, and everything will be in these areas. And the more we can hit in these areas, the better for us, the more scope we have to, to, to bid for the money, basically. So going through this list again, um, artificial intelligence and robotics is an ob obvious choice, but this is too limiting um, and it's very, very oversubscribed. So this is a competitive process with a success rate of about five to 10%. So we need to be extremely careful that uh, as, as, as uh, every gambler knows, we need to spread our risk and we need to be careful that we are not focusing on this only. So if we look at this and we say, okay, I do artificial intelligence and robotics, let's focus on this. That's very, very dangerous. So we need to identify a broader spectrum and we need to identify something that we can do that is competitive in the European landscape and that is not oversubscribed. So um, low carbon and clean industry, energy systems, grids, buildings, community cities, smart mobility. These are the areas that I identified as being something that we as MTU have expertise in and that we can um, uh, target in terms of our um, applications for research funding. And this is really the framework and the motivation as to why uh, we came up or I came up with this human cyber physical systems uh, area um, that uh, uh, I have been spending most of my uh, most of my years at CIT uh, uh, working on. So um, let's 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 look about uh, what 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 that means, uh, human cyber physical systems. Um, so and and again, let's look at how that tackles climate change because these are the missions. So everything we do when we are when we want to tap into this bunny pool, it needs to be somehow related. Um, to, uh, to, to solving climate change. And um, there is a very traditional industrial infrastructure to solution to that problem. And that is quite popular in the common discussion because basically it means let's just replace everything with, uh, with something uh, that is carbon neutral, uh, but pretty much looks the same. So our cars will look the same, but we plug them into the into the wall, and and then we have electric cars, our factories, our homes, everything. Just make it climate neutral, and uh, don't bother me. Everything that 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 might cause as a as a problem is is cost, and um, that that might sound attractive in the political discourse, but. Unfortunately, it's quite unrealistic that this will happen in this way. So uh, the policy, the European policy doesn't focus on this. Although there are, of course, projects that do that, um, this is not the end all. And most, 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 pro, uh, most calls in that program are, are much broader in scope. So the, the next idea, and that's something that we might uh, consider as computer scientists a lot, is to look at what, what, what we phrase cyber physical systems. And cyber physical systems are basically trying to, um, to, to, to use a computational approach uh, to that problem of, of climate change. And what that usually means is we are creating models of what's going on and we're optimizing these models. Um, and, and, and then, of course, if we operate 
in, uh, in these optimized models, then the expectation is that we reduce waste uh, and, and, and in this sense, make everything more efficient. Um, and, and that's great and, and certainly something we can do. But what that neglects is that uh, most systems are actually uh, used by people and, and people don't like to be monitored and controlled uh, all the time. So um, this engineering approach where basically we are uh, 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 focusing on let's, let's, let's model everything in our, our systems, let's automate everything and have a perfect system which doesn't include human in, in, in the loop, um, that uh, uh, of course from a computer science perspective might sound attractive, but again, this is not realistic, and we we need to 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 be uh, to be clear about that. So, what happened then, of course, is that uh, we all have smartphone apps now, and we have dashboards, and the computer science crowd somehow thought that uh, integrating people into these cyber physical systems just means them to interact with the cyber systems. So, with the with the with the smartphone apps and the dashboards, and uh, then. Uh, we, we can keep it under control in a sense. Um, the, the, the problem with that, however, is that most of the interactions that I have with the real world are with the physical environment itself. So what this traditional cyber-physical um, system approach is lacking is um, this uh, connection between the, the people and the real world. So how do we interact with our environment um, and how important is that for uh, optimizing these, these systems? And this is what we coined as, uh, as human cyber physical systems over the, the last couple of years, um, where the idea is not only to monitor and control what people are doing by means of sending of, 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 uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the cyber physical approach, but really utilize the behavior of people within their physical and environment. So uh, when, when people are uh, behaving in their physical environment, they can actuate on, uh, on what's happening and they are making the decision at the end of the day. So the majority of things that we want to solve are in this, uh, in this triangle of uh, mutual relationship between these, these, three, um, these three subject areas. And that leads also to the crux of the problem because this is an inherently multidisciplinary approach. And this approach also crosses faculty lines, which makes it very, very unattractive for universities that think in silos. And that is certainly one of the benefits of MTU and, uh, and, and, and the Nimble Center in particular, um, that um, this siloed approach, while it is part of the engineering departments, but this siloed approach is broken up by, by, by the requirement to self-funding. So the money basically makes everything possible that can be funded. And, and, and that's great. Um, and that is, is really what is creating this gap in the market that we try to exploit uh, 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 over, over the last couple of years by bringing together people from the engineering science, people from the psychology, and people from the computer science field and solve these human cyber physical systems uh, as, as, as one piece, uh, making us a very attractive partner to contribute uh, to, these, uh, to these larger European projects. Um, there is a couple of very interesting uh, fundamental questions that uh, are, are specific to human cyber physical systems. So we need to model human behavior in some shape or form for us to be able to optimize this. Um, there is a learning aspect to it where we learn behavioral patterns and calibrate these models. Um, but then we also need to integrate the human behavioral models with the physical process models to facilitate this joint optimization of these processes. There is a bit of, of user experience design in there, which, which we also tackled uh, uh, to, to a degree. Um, and then there is 
this model-based optimization of systems, including human participants. And that's, that's where the majority of the projects that we are focusing on uh, are. Um, and of course, when we include human participants, we need to focus on explainability and security and on trust. So we, we cannot just exclude uh, humans from that. And the two application areas are in industry, uh, in work processes, which we, which, which is sometimes called behavior operations research. And then in the energy domain, we mainly talk about behavior demand response. So I will talk about behavior demand response uh, in the in the next couple of, of slides. Um, and this human cyber physical systems agenda um, has brought in four large European projects into MTU over the last couple of years. Uh, they are about half a million each. So this is about 2 million euro for MTU. So the projects are much larger, but the MTU part of those projects together um, that are uh, funding the human cyber physical systems research is about 2 million over, um, over, over a period of time. Um, and I will talk about um, one particular project for the reminder of, uh, 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 of uh, the, the last, I'm not sure how many minutes I have, but um, I will talk about the Hestia project. The Hestia project uh, started in, uh, at the end of 2020. Um, it will run until the end of 2023. The overall budget is seven and a half million. And MTU, uh, as I said, uh, got uh, just shy of half a million euro from that. So for, for uh, 420,000. Um, and the idea of the Hestia project or, the, or the, 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 the goal of the Hestia project is to match the energy supply with, with the energy demand in a residential setting. So um, as, as you know, energy is produced by, by, by our energy producers like uh, the ASB. Um, and then we are, as, uh, 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 as homeowners, we are buying uh, electricity and gas from the energy suppliers. Um, and we are using these energy uh, in, our, in our homes. And for electrical energy in particular, the supply and the demand, they need to be exactly balanced. Batteries are extremely expensive, so they are really not a big option in here. Um, so what we need to do is we need to make sure that the supply and the demand are balanced at all times. So that is what the energy grids are trying to do. They are trying to balance the, uh, the, 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 these, two, uh, these two sides of the energy system at, at, at all time. And traditionally, um, what we are used to, um, the assumption is that whatever I decide to use in terms of energy, the ESB will supply. So the energy supply is completely transparent to the consumer. That is the traditional assumption. And what that, uh, what that means is that the way we tackle this is a classical cyber physical system. So we are predicting the aggregated demand. We are optimizing our assets. And then um, we are uh, running our assets, our energy assets, to deliver the energy on this demand. And we are uh, dealing with real time fluctuation through control systems. So, so that's, that's the, 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 the traditional approach to energy supply. It has a couple of shortcomings and they are quite important. Um, first of all, the capacity needs to be sized to meet peak demand. If the expectation is that I can always draw as much energy as I want, if my whole estate wants to now plug in their Teslas, the ESB is in trouble. So that is why the charging infrastructure for electrical cars is lagging. It's not that the charging points are too expensive, they are not. The grid is simply not able to cope with this a kind of transparent expectation of demand and and that's 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 communicated quite quite weakly i would say in the in the common discourse um, there are other problems and that is that the output of the production assets it needs to be controllable so we cannot include renewables and if we do we have to have gas fired uh, so, uh, backup plants that are installed for each renewable asset we, 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 we integrate into the system. And this is the reason why now renewable energy becomes dependent on the price, on the rising price of Russian gas. And that makes this, this, this problem um, extremely difficult uh, or, or this approach extremely difficult to implement if we want to increase our renewable assets in the system. And 
and and this is 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 really something that we we need to solve. So so what's the what's the approach? What's the idea that uh, that that people are having uh, when uh, when we talk about residential behavior demand response, which is the focus of uh, of the Hestia project? Um, and the suggested alternative is really a, high, uh, a human cyber physical system approach uh, in making the consumer an active participant of this energy system. So instead of having the consumer as, uh, as, as some sort of um, just driving the demand, what we can do is we can continuously interact with the consumer and we can basically integrate them into the system. On a technical level, what that means on, for, 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 for the optimization problem, uh, we can now um, use the, the predicted supply based on the weather forecast, we can use that as an input to the system and not as a noise term into the system. So that makes a big difference in terms of the type of optimization uh, 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 problem that we're solving, but also the demand flexibility that people are having. You can decide yourself when you do your laundry or when you do your cooking. Um, this demand flexibility can be used as an asset in itself and it can be used to balance out the renewable energies. And that might be uh, better than the gas plant that the ESB is providing for us at all times. So um, the, the challenge, obviously, in particular in a residential setting is that most assets are manually controlled or at least embedded in household practices. So uh, your laundry, you decide yourself when you do your laundry. And even if you have a sophisticated uh, uh, machine that has a timer, it, it still requires you to get up at four in the night uh, to, to load the laundry uh, uh, if you want to use your, your timer efficiently. So, so so there is a lot of um, uh, 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 problems associated with this in the residential settings. Um, and the optimizer then needs to be obviously able to cope with this uncertainty. And crucially, and that's quite important, the human participants, they need to stay engaged. They need to be kept on board. So the optimization cannot be only pure balancing or pure cost. It needs to include indicators in the objective function that relate to motivation of people. And the, the key idea really is, and, and, and that, that, sorry, that is, uh, that is quite simple, um, is instead of taking the occupants out of this, this control loop, uh, we can basically ask them to do stuff for us. And, and, and that is called uh, demand response or behavior demand response, where we, we simply, um, instead of controlling the assets auto fully automatically and everybody confused what's happening in their home, uh, that is undesirable. We are keeping the occupants in the loop and that gives us uh, a couple of advantages. It allows us to reach assets that are manually controlled, um, but it also allows to coordinate the operation of the system between the different stakeholders, including the residents. And also it avoids the feeling of not being in control um, and it increases engagement and motivation. At least that's what we, what we hope for. So um, I think I'm running out of time, uh, but uh, I, I'll, 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 I'll keep on, on mentioning things. So what we are doing is we are doing model-based optimization. So we create a joint asset and behavioral model um, that then combines um, uh, models of human behavior with uh, with, with, with physical asset models. And this then allows us to do model predictive control, but involving models of human behavior. And the important thing here is we are not, um, uh, we, are, we are basing this very much on established research in psychology and, and, and SSH, uh, social science and humanities, um, who are developing um, models that can be very well integrated into these uh, into these structures uh, into these uh, these these systems and um, this is really the unique selling point that has been working for us quite well in the last couple of years. So, uh, considering the time, I'm skimming skimming over this. So, so this is the model we've been developing, and then there's a couple of publications which I uh, which I'm not going into into too much detail. Um, but in the in the context of the of the Hestia project. Um, what we are what we are doing is these uh, behavioral models. They provide us with mutual relationships. They provide us with a topology for graphical models. So graphical models are uh, a little bit dated approach in optimization and artificial intelligence, but they are extremely useful to translate these explainable models 
into something that we can uh, that we can calculate and compute. Furthermore, the psychological models, they are empirically validated. So we're able to measure subsets of variables and then we're able to calibrate on top of that and to um, optimize um, this, this whole system with a set of variables that are crucially explainable because what we need to achieve here in these systems is not only do we need to send messages to people to do this or that. If I just sent you a text message, do your laundry at three in the night, you will be very unhappy, I suppose. So what you want to do is you want to shape your messages in a way that they maximize motivation and also that you have reasonable explanations uh, as to how these messages are, are, are generated. So explainability is a, is, a, is a big driver of trust in these types of systems. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. So I'm coming to my last slide for the SDR project. If everything goes well, we will be evaluating these in three different sites, one in the Netherlands, one uh, in, in the vicinity of Paris, uh, and, and one in, in Sardinia, uh, in Italy. Um, so uh, this, of course, has uh, lots of cultural implications as well, uh, uh, lots of implications uh, on, uh, from, from coming from climate conditions and, um, uh, and of course, the, uh, uh, the socioeconomic uh, um, situation of people. So this is the wider project that, uh, that, that other partners are, are, are also contributing to. Um, and with that, uh, uh, thank you very much. I hope I uh, kept my time. So I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Good, thanks Christian. Um, okay, just a quick question. Um, what, what kind of sample size the need for participants from those sites? Yes, that's a very good question. And um, the, the reason why we are using these uh, empirical validated psychological models is that by using the topology from these models, a lot of uh, evaluation work uh, on these models has been done already. So, so this is something that we are basing these, uh, uh, these on. And that distinguishes us from these pure AI approaches like the Google Nest, which was extremely unsuccessful because people didn't like it. People wanted to stay in control. Um, uh, being a purely unexplainable machine learning approach wasn't successful, even for a company like Google. Um, and then um, if we have now these graphical models, the graphical models have very few parameters, so we can learn these parameters from, um, uh, from, from, from rather smaller sample sizes. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we, 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 we are talking about hundreds of, of dwellings uh, uh, roundabout, um, but, uh, and, and, and then we use uh, 12 months of, of data for, for a couple of hundred uh, dwellings. Um, but of course, that wouldn't be sufficient to learn pure machine learning type of approaches. And also, I don't want to compete with these. Uh, this is really the, the most important one here is that we are trying to um, uh, to, to be unique uh, and have a unique selling point uh, that allows us to uh, compete with, uh, with the bigger players. Good, perfect. Any other questions from the... Yeah. Yeah, listen. I can't no. hear you. Yeah, you're on mute, sure. <clears throat> no, you I weren't on mute. You. It was your microphones not working. Oh, sorry. Okay, no. hello, hello. Yeah. There you go. Okay, okay, okay. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, I want to just go backwards to the to the beginning. When you were writing a proposal for this topic, it's so interesting that you say there's a human in the loop. So there's this element of interacting with a human who's slightly unpredictable, but you can make some predictions. Did you have to have um, uh, someone with expertise in the area of maybe psychology or? Yes. So, so when you're creating a proposal with this um, targeted piece of money in mind, you are creating a team that I guess meets those demands. Yes, okay. that is crucial. So it is not, and, and that's very important for writing these European proposals. Um, first of all, you need to do exactly what they want. This is why you need to study these, these policy documents a lot. Um, and then uh, your reviewed um, on the basis of, uh, um, well, uh, 
your reviewed uh, okay the, the the answer to that is more complicated i suppose i'm i'm trying to uh, uh to 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 come up with something uh, uh more tangible here um what what you need to do is you are reviewed against a couple of competing proposals usually you have 20 proposals for about two or one to two slots so that gives a probability of about 5% so what you need is a unique selling point and um it is uh, and 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 breaking this faculty boundary is something that gave us this unique selling point over the past uh, years so bringing somebody with psychological experience in there and having a sentence or or a section in there writing we have this body of psychological research on the model development and the computer science people they don't focus on developing psychological models they focus on optimizing these psychological models uh, that is the unique selling point that distinguishes us from other people let's say who are proposing to be experts in everything that is a a big danger that we that we fall into as uh, coming freshly let's say from a phd background you you have your tunnel view on your only one project you don't see the bigger picture of of of, of things and then you either make the mistake of only focusing funding that is in that narrow area and at 5% success rate, that will inevitably fail. So you need to broaden your scope in terms of what are you able and willing to target. And then you need to be willing also to go multidisciplinary. So you need to acknowledge that you are not the expert in everything. Even if your feeling is that you're the most clever person in the world, as, as, as some of us, uh, including myself, uh, often, often have, um, you need to acknowledge that there are other disciplines in the world and that they have interesting things to contribute as well so so that's that's really the the main message i want to convey here okay thank you angus hi christian angus here very good interesting um presentation um on that psychology front also um is this kind like to me one of the ways of doing this would be just to give uh, money wise for electricity and they're kind of going toward that already in a sense of if encourage people with discounts in electricity price um but this whole area of psychology and behavior of humans is um this kind of nudge economics um um and this won't work for everyone I, my i've only a vague understanding um of this but is if it works for like 80 percent of people is that enough like if there's people that don't like this kind of system, yes, the, there's going the, to be some people that are awkward. Yes, um, the idea is to have different messaging for different people. So what this model does is it estimates parameters for individuals, um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's probably a little bit small here. Uh, but on the bottom end, you you're referencing there the scale of motivation, uh, and and there is a, a a scale between what's called Extra, external regulation. So that is what uh, uh, people who are driven by, uh, by monetary incentives, for instance. But um, the research that we carried out is that this is by far the least important aspect of that. Also, there is this whole field of gamification that computer scientists like ourselves come up with. And then if we do the psychological research, we figure out that this is affecting three to 5% of people uh, in this domain. So um, we are missing out on 95% of people. And that is why these approaches are so uh, unsuccessful. So what I'm advocating here is that as computer scientists, we, we shouldn't uh, think about, uh, well, we know money because we earn money and we know games because we, we, we like games or something. So we do money and games. That's the wrong approach, in particular in the energy domain. If you're talking about, um, if you're talking about let's say, the monetary incentive for behavior, the electrical behavior demand response, the monetary savings will be uh, roughly maybe 50 to 100 euros per year on an individualized level. So what you're doing is you're using a collective and optimizing for the collective will be, of course, uh, 
monetizing this in a, in a, in a much broader uh, sense than, than saving 50 to 100 euros. But if I tell to you that now that you, and, and the ESB is falling in their trap, so they sent me a letter and they wrote me that I now have a smart meter installed in my home. So all I need to go do is I need to log onto their website. I need to sign up to a large terms and condition thing. And then I might, if they are really nice to me, might save three euros per month. Uh, and and, and uh, well, that, that, that's, that's what they're doing. And I can tell you, it's not very successful. So um, uh, the, the <laughs> uh, of course, this is anecdotal. And we, we have also some research to back this up. So, um, and, and there's lots of criticism on nudge theory. Uh, again, we are, we are doing this as a research team for, for many years. So I have lots of answers to, to many of, of your, your questions here in, in a lot of detail. But the important thing here is to base this on actual research and not base this on the idea, what can I do? That is, is the fallacy that I'm trying to avoid and that these models try to avoid here. So when we are learning the parameters in these models, what we figure out is that, for instance, perceived behavioral control, which you see there on the top right corner of that little uh, graphical model there of this little graph, is one of the most important drivers that is people want to be in control of their own environment. I give you another example. I've been in the smartest building of Ireland, uh, one Eden Key in Cork City. That's the Johnson Control Building. And they were very proud of their lift that didn't have any keys. So um, basically, it, because it was the smartest building, the lift decided for me which, which uh, level I wanted to go. Unfortunately, uh, it decided wrongly. So I ended up in the wrong level. And it took about half an hour to get me out of this building again. And then that's just a very extreme example of where smart technology is simply something that in particular in a residential setting, that was a commercial building. So I, uh, I was on, on, on CIT's clock there, so that was fine. But imagine that uh, the Nest, the Google Nest is deciding how warm you like your, uh, your, your, your bedroom um, and you don't agree with that. Or even if you agree with that, wouldn't you want, uh, or, 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 or your, your, your wife, your partner, whatever, uh, wouldn't they want to have some control over what's going on? Or are we, um, uh, again, falling into this trap of full controllability? This is very, very dangerous. And all psychological research points us in a different direction. So what this tries to do really is, um, of course, from an optimization perspective, I'm completely agnostic. I'm optimizing an objective function. And whatever the objective function tells me, that's what we are doing. But uh, what we can observe is that the objective function tells us things that um, are not necessarily considered if we are not optimizing for these types of parameters. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yep, 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 yep. So Very it's good. not all economics Thanks and it's very much. not all uh, <laughs> whatever we come up with. And Christian, this, this, is my particular pet hate. <laughs> and this model, is, is this some kind of algorithm model with um, parameters and all this, this model in front of us? Yes. Very but good. based on established psychological theories that, I, that, that it tries to encode in colors and, and so on. So, so there is... There's a couple of, of, of papers that, uh, of course, we uh, we developed over the years. And you train it on the test set or the test group then with the three sites. You're going to refine it. Yes. Yes. Fine tune it. Very good. Thanks very we much. Also, we also calibrate this on the individual. So whenever you start using the system, then uh, it will uh, estimate parameters for you individually. But you won't give um, discounts per person by price either. Uh, we might, but uh, again, uh, as uh, uh, what we are doing is we are doing is a joint model-based optimization. So when the joint model-based optimization tells us to do that, we do that. But uh, the experience is that it doesn't, interestingly. Uh, and could, the, could a person game the system as in work out to act in a particular way to get cheaper price? Um, maybe that's the case. Um, the 
question, however, is, well, this is usually integrated, not in a way that it is integrated with the dynamic pricing model. As I said, the variability on an individual level is in the range between 50 yeah. and 200 euros per year. So uh, if you spend all your time gaming the system, you might gain 200 euros or max per year. Uh, and and that, that might not sound like a attractive proposition. If it does, fair play to you, but then uh, <laughs> I, I don't think uh, you, <laughs> you're doing it right. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. In terms of delivery question, yes. like if you're relying on five or six other partners that are all doing pieces of this, yes, I mean, like, I assume that those pieces don't talk to each other that well a lot of the time or... You know, if one, you have if one seen me in our joint office banging my head against the wall, haven't you? So yeah. the reality is that, uh, of course, uh, it is very, very frustrating and uh, something that uh, sometimes drives me beyond uh, my, my limits. But uh, uh, with all that in mind, um, it is still um, a sizable project and a, a, a sizable opportunity to gain access to these test sites. So, so that is why I, I closed with this last slide here, um, that uh, if we weren't participating in these, in these large scale projects, what we would be missing out of is, is, is first of all, the industrial partners who are doing that and who are giving us perspective on that. It is, we are, at the end of the day, we are a small partner in this. This is a 7.5 million euro out of which we get half a million. So um, there are other more important partners in that. So that's the first reason you should always talk to people who give you a different perspective. It's, it's not a good idea to, um, uh, to develop these things without talking to anybody and synchronizing yourself with the ideas of other people. Um, and, and second of all, of course, it is about the access to the, uh, to the test site sites, which uh, unfortunately, because of COVID travel restrictions, has uh, has been uh, lagging behind a lot. So I haven't been to any of these sites yet. Um, uh, and um, we will see how that goes, if that needs an extension, uh, and so on. But you're right, uh, the, the, the communication with the partners will eat up most of your time. So uh, it is not something that, uh, that you will do a lot of research on. You will, and that's why I prefaced this with my role in this is more that of a research manager. Um, so you will be um, mostly uh, trying to solve non-research uh, uh, problems in this uh, in this space.